Dr. Paul Brand. NASA and other big international organizations have been trying for a long time to find intelligence in space. Is there intelligence in Mars or Venus or in some distant galaxy? And they do it by focusing radio telescopes and sweeping the entire sky. And what they're looking for, they have decided, and all scientists pretty much are agreed about this, the best way to recognize and define intelligence is the ability to create a code and to make it say something meaningful and to be able to read it back. You see? Uh, dogs and elephants and people are very beautiful and they have some degree of intelligence, but only the human race, only that level of intelligence can put things down into code and read them back. And what do we mean by code? Supposing I wanted this guy over here to move over there into another seat. I could do it by directly helping him. I could go down there and, and push uh, and move him or help him to move. That isn't a code, that's just doing it. Or I could use a kind of a universal simplistic code. I could point to him and say, look, over there. Huh? Come on, come on. And I wouldn't need to use words because there's a kind of a universality, but even a very simple, even a, a dog or a cat, uh, if you, if you uh, indicate what... And if you're hungry in a foreign country, you can't speak the language, you go, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> and everybody sort of knows that you're, you're... Now, that's a crude code. But if I simply say, uh, please, will you move to the next seat without moving my hands, that is a code. And if he only speaks Japanese, he wouldn't understand. Uh, now, that is what we may mean by code, something which is directed to people who understand a language or a way of writing or a way of speaking <clears throat> and that can respond to it. Now, the body is full of codes. <laughs> and if scientists are agreed in saying that a code is a sign of intelligence because it contains no direct assistance to the action that you want to do, it simply speaks in a code which is common to all actions and has to be understood and transcribed, that is a code, and the body is full of them. Now, last, last time I was with you, I was talking about what I call fast codes. Uh, everything that you feel, every sensation, touch, pain, uh, hearing, sight, and we talked about the eye, and the way in which images of light are transduced into electrical impulses and taken to the brain where they are decoded and created back into an image. Now that is a code, and it's a fast code. It happens right at once. And all fast codes, all nerves, have this, these features in common. First of all, they all have a pathway. There's a pathway from my eye into my brain, and it's called a nerve. All those pathways are kind of electrical. They are produced by, by uh, uh, polarizing and depolarizing membranes and, and breaking up ions and so forth. Uh, they have a pathway. They have a specific stimulus which creates a little code that runs up the pathway and is decoded in the brain. And there are lots of them. Now, I'm, let's finish with those. Today I'm going to talk about something in a way, even more remarkable, even more remarkable, I'm going to talk about what I call slow codes. These are codes that take a little time, and they have no pathway. They go from a specific gland in the body, and they reach every single cell in the body. We call them hormones. Now, uh, a hormone is created with a specific objective in view, and it, is, it requires different action by different cells. Now, a very typical code that we use today in hospitals is called code blue. Have you heard of code blue? You know what it is? If there's a particular kind of emergency in a, in a hospital, and a patient suddenly stops breathing, or his heart suddenly stops beating, you know that you have four and a half minutes to get 
breathing started or to get the heart beating again before the person has irreversible damage. And it requires a lot of different people to act very decisively. So you broadcast over the radio of the hospital that goes to all the wards and all the operating rooms. You say, code blue, ward 25. Code blue, ward 25. Everybody who hears that responds to that code differently. If you're just a visitor or a cleaner or a sweeper, you just get out. You run away from the ward. If you're a heart surgeon, you run to the ward. Uh, perhaps the supply department, there's somebody there who knows that whenever he has code blue, he's got to carry a cylinder of oxygen to the place where the need is. Everybody has a different job to do, and most people don't respond at all. Most people just get on with their task. But those who have critical tasks know what they have to do. Now, that is a code. And you couldn't possibly have a code blue uh, without preparation, without design, without intelligence. If I suddenly said, hey, guys, code blue, well, go on. <laughs> Nobody's moving because we haven't prepared it. it doesn't, it's meaningless unless it's designed. OK? Now, let me tell you just about a couple of them to, to indicate what we're talking about. One of the best, one of the commonest understood codes is adrenaline. You all heard of adrenaline? You know that adrenaline happens. Adrenaline is poured into the bloodstream in cases of physical crisis. If you're going for a walk in the woods and uh, you suddenly meet a bear or a lion, uh, the first thing that happens is you, your brain, your, your eyes see it, your ears hear the growl, you see the claws sticking out, and immediately uh, your brain sends a, a message to your adrenal glands. They are placed just above the kidneys. It's nothing to do with the kidney, but it receives a definite message from the hypothalamus and the pituitary and so forth, and it says, pour out some adrenaline into the blood. <laughs> and adrenaline is poured out into the blood, and every cell, every cell has a blood supply, and every cell receives a tiny speck of the hormone adrenaline. Now, every cell reacts differently. They all know that there's a crisis. They don't know what the crisis is, but they want to be prepared to do something fast and strongly. Now, we were talking about the eye last time. The pupil of the eye determines how much light gets into the eye. And if adrenaline reaches the eye, the pupil gets bigger. So more light gets in, and you can see faster what is happening. It's very important. Uh, the heart immediately starts pumping blood faster. More blood gets pumped out, and therefore blood pressure rises. The tubes that you breathe through, the bronchi, all the tubes are perfectly adequate for ordinary breathing. But you may have to breathe deeply because you may have to run. And so that you can breathe deeply, the tubes get ready for it because when they receive a little speck of adrenaline, they all get wider. They all open up to allow air to come in and out faster. And then there's a thing called smooth muscle. Uh, you may have heard of this if you've been doing biology, but all the blood vessels in the body are lined and controlled by circular little strands of muscle. And they respond to hormones, but not much to nerves. Now, uh, what do you need in an emergency? Do you need to digest your food? No, forget it. All the blood vessels that go to the guts, to the stomach and the intestines, they all shut down. Not completely, but the smooth muscle, the little muscle cells around those blood vessels, they all go into spasm. So that what was a big blood vessel supplying the stomach becomes a small blood vessel and cuts down the blood to the stomach. So you don't want to have a meal when you're <laughs> under the influence of adrenaline. Uh, stress makes a bad digestion, so remember that. Uh, but the blood vessels that go to the muscles open up. And this is the interesting thing. This is so amazing about this code. The smooth muscle that controls the blood vessels 
to the muscles, to the big muscles of the body, is exactly the same smooth muscle as controls the blood vessels going to the guts. The message of adrenaline is the same. The receptors are the same, smooth muscle around the blood vessels. But just those that go to muscles open up, and just those that go to the digestion close down. Isn't it incredible that the cells that recognize the molecule of adrenaline that comes to them, even though the cells are of the same type, carried by the same bloodstream from the same glands, they respond in opposite ways. Because the whole thing has been thought out beforehand. It's been planned as a code response. Uh, to me, <laughs> that blows my mind. I, it really, it's, it's, quite, it's quite incredible. And it is typical of the slow codes. Now, I'm not going to spend any more time on adrenaline. And of course, there are dozens of others. There are, there are codes that regulate digestion. There are codes that regulate many, many things. But uh, because you're most of you the age you are, I'm going to talk a little bit about sex hormones. Because these rise and fall during the time that you're growing up. And some people are girls, and some people are boys. Most of the code that builds your body and your brain are the same. The quality of your bones is the same. The nature of your skin is the same. The nature of your brain is the same. All these things are all the same. But where it's important that there should be a difference, it's usually controlled by a hormone. And the first thing I want to, s to tell you about hormones is that although girls may look very different from boys, their hormones look very much the same. Uh, I, I'd often make a mistake. If I, I don't make a mistake about girls and boys, but I make a mistake about the chemicals that determine. Here, for example, progesterone happens to be a female chemical. You see there are four, uh, six carbon rings. There's an oxygen off here. There's a C carbon and oxygen here. And there's an acetyl molecule here. Uh, here, are, here is a male hormone, testosterone. You see there's a, there are one, two, three, four. There are four, six carbon rings, the same as that. There's an oxygen and there's an oxygen. Of course, there are, there are radicals all the way around these, but they're the same from, for the test, progesterone and the testosterone. Here we, have a, uh, here we have only a hydroxy molecule there in place of the, the carbon and the oxygen here. But you see, if you're a little cell tucked away deep in the body, not able to see, you don't know anything about chemistry, and a little molecule comes to you. Now, is it, a male, is it progesterone? Is it estrin? Is it, is it androsterone? What is it? Is it, is it adrenaline? Uh, if you find out that you're, you're a girl, you don't just start breathing heavily or having a high blood pressure. Uh, you've got to know what to do with these little tiny chemical changes that come to you through the bloodstream. And it alters, every, it, al it alters a whole lot of things. And you see, these hormones reach every cell, but not every cell is affected. It's a code. It's a code. It's designed. Now, one of the things it affects is bone. Now, I want you to imagine, because to me, it's, I still don't understand it. Nobody understands it. How an osteoblast, an osteoblast is a living cell, and you've got millions of them in your body. And everybody who's growing has a very large number of bone-producing cells. When you get to my age, I've only got a very few. I've got one in here, I think. Another one maybe over here, but I mean, there aren't many. I don't need them. Osteoclasts are cells that take bone away and put it back into the bloodstream in its original elements. The special skill, uh, an osteoblast only has one thing to do all its life, from birth to death, an osteoblast is trained to snatch from the bloodstream. It reaches out into the bloodstream, and it catches atoms and molecules that contain calcium. And it finds molecules that contain phosphorus. And it combines the calcium and the phosphorus together to make calcium phosphate, which is insoluble. And it forms these, together with collagen, into a speck 
of bone, rather like a brick. If you're, if you're a bricklayer, your job is to build a wall. And the only thing you know how to do is to build walls. <laughs> and you have a pile of bricks over here, and you have some cement over there, and you have a wall in front of you, and your job is to, is to pick up your trowel and take some cement and put it on the wall, pick up a brick and put it there, and tap it a little bit to get it in line with the piece of string which tells you where it's supposed to be. Uh, and then you pick up another brick. That's all you have to do. And if you were, a, if you were an unbricklayer, if you were a, a demolition expert, your job would be to take bricks away <laughs> and throw them into a, into a brick pile. That's all they have to do, and it sounds rather simple. But I want you to imagine that you are an osteoblast. First of all, how do you know where you are? How do you know where to put your bricks? Now, I, as I was coming into this building here five, ten minutes ago, uh, there's a, I saw a beautiful plan of the, of the school. And it showed me where the halls were and where the classrooms were and where the lavatories were and so forth. And there was a big arrow pointing on all these lines. And it said, you are here. And that arrow told me exactly where I was. And if I had been a bricklayer with a pile of bricks, uh, I could have seen where I was supposed to be, and I would have found out whether that was an area I had to put a brick. Because you don't want to put bricks across the corridor. You want to put bricks where they need to be put. And that's true, that's true of, of these bones. But suppose I, looking at that diagram, were blind, had no sense of vision or hearing. The area was silent. And I was living in a kind of a soup where, you see, there's no space around an osteoblast. It's part of an embryo, part of a young person growing, surrounded by other cells doing other things. How do I know where I am? How do I know whether I'm in the arm or in the leg or in the face? Am I building a jaw? Am I building a, a humerus or a femur? Where am I? And I don't know. Do you know that nobody knows how one of the billion trillion cells in how it knows exactly where it is? And it knows what it has to do because it's an osteoblast. It has to put bricks down. But how does it know where the walls are supposed to be? And how does it know where to stop? Where there's supposed to be a door, you, you don't go on building bricks across the door, you, you stop. And how does this little lonely osteoblast sitting there with a brick in one hand and a trowel in the other, how does it know? And do you know, with all of our science, we don't know. All we know is that it has information. Now, I've, I've kept all these encyclopedias here because the DNA, which is the basic code of the body, it has that information. And as cells... You know, you begin with being one cell and two cells and sperms and over and so forth, and they all get together and they start dividing and dividing, and you get 10, you know, four cells, then eight, then 16, then 32, and then 64 and 128 or whatever it is. You go on multiplying until you're getting hundreds and thousands and then millions of cells. But the cell that is going to sit on that point of the pelvis and lay bricks at that time through all these dividings, that little information about where that cell is going to be is being passed on from cell to cell to cell to cell. And when you, when you turn left, when you divide into two, the information for that particular bone goes left, and it isn't in that cell. And then when those two divide, it takes this one. And somehow the knowledge infiltrates through the body and tells that little osteoblast where it is. But then how does it know when to start and when to stop? Why doesn't my arm get longer and longer and longer until it's 10 feet long? Uh, well, you know, the, the, the statement as to when you start and when you stop is partly under the control of hormones. Now, hormones are not part of the plan, the blueprint, that I was looking at downstairs, which says you are here and this is where the wall is supposed to be. There's no such visible, tangible thing that we can define. But somewhere in the DNA program, somewhere in this 
miles and miles and miles of code, that information is there. And part of that information, now listen to this, part of that information says things like this. When you feel extra stress, I don't know how an osteoblast knows what is normal stress. You know, how much my weight rests on my leg bones. The osteoblasts of my leg bones, they know how much stress is appropriate for my leg bones. If I never stop eating and I get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, my legs have got to bear bigger and bigger weight and ultimately they'll break. And in any human machine, the girders and the struts and the scaffolding and all the rest is designed to bear a certain weight. And if you increase, if you habitually put more weight than it's supposed to bear, it will break. But in the human, the little bone cells are listening to the stress pattern. And they are programmed in the DNA, they are programmed when they feel extra stress to add more bone and make the bone thicker. And you'll find a person who is very much overweight has thicker bones. The bones build up because the osteoblasts have gotten the message. And if, on the other hand, you starve yourself and stay in bed and don't put weight on your legs, the osteoclasts get the message. And they say, this bone isn't being used very much. Why waste a lot of calcium, good calcium, which could be used somewhere else? Why use it up on the bone? And they begin to take bricks away from the wall. And if you don't use your legs, they're going to, the bones are going to get osteoporotic. Have you heard that word? Have you heard it in terms of the astronauts? Do you know what happens if you're an astronaut? If you're an astronaut, you're in a weightless situation in space. And the longer you stay in space, the longer your osteoclasts get the message, this weight-bearing bone is not bearing weight anymore. This person is not utilizing the strength we have given him. Let's take it away. And so they take away the bricks. And when an astronaut lands on the ground again and is subject to gravity, if he's been up in the sky for, for a year or two, the chances are when he starts to walk or run, his legs will break. His legs will break. They become osteoporotic. And therefore, it's very important, A, for astronauts to exercise while they're in the space capsule so as to, in, so as to tell, send a message to their, to their uh, uh, osteoblasts and osteoclasts, yes, we, we're going to go back to where we need to bear weight. Uh, and it's also important when they come back to Earth to do it gradually, to give their osteoblast time to restore the bone that was taken away while they weren't bearing. Isn't that incredible? Can you imagine being an osteoblast, being a living cell that has to make these decisions? Now, let me tell you, I was talking about female hormones and male hormones. This, this uh, skeleton, uh, now I'm an osteoblast, or you are, and you're sitting here, okay? Uh, and that is, that is called the sacrotuberous ligament. It's a projection of bone that strengthens the pelvis. And it's pointing towards the coccyx, and it doesn't matter what it is, but anyhow. It's, it's a useful mechanical projection of bone to strengthen a muscle action and a ligament, okay? It makes for a stronger pelvis. If that osteoblast gets a hormone which says to it, I am a girl, Immediately, that osteoblast will begin to retreat and the osteoclasts take over because somehow it knows, somehow it has been informed, although it doesn't know where it is, it hasn't got any pattern, it can't see, it's got no, no fast nerves to tell it what to do. Somehow it knows that in that particular position, if it is in a girl, and if that girl grows into a woman and has a baby, that projection 
is going to stick into the baby's head. And if, and if this projection sticks too far out, that baby will never get born. It'll get stuck in the pelvis, and the woman will die, and the human race will come to an end. So although that Bernie projection is a good Bernie projection, it has a function, and it's nice, it makes a stronger walking and jumping action, girls mustn't have it. And then, there's some others. There's one round here. And uh, if you want to have an efficient, if you want to have an efficient uh, way of walking, you have two hip joints. You can see them there, too. And uh, it's very convenient and nice for the two hip joints, which control two legs, to have the joints fairly close together. Because when you walk, you alternately take one leg off the ground. Did you know that? <laughs> you alternately take one leg off the ground. You take it off the ground. And now, your whole weight is on the other hip. Now, if your hips are a long way apart, then when you take this leg off the ground, your main body weight, resting only on this hip over here, you're going to fall over this way. Because you've got too much weight on one side of the hip. So, men know that. And their hips are pretty close together. Not very close, but pretty close. It leaves room between the two hips for things like the rectum and the bladder and all the rest of it. Men don't have many things in there. Uh, but when those little osteoblasts and osteoclasts are making a pelvis, somehow the code which they get, if you, if you read this encyclopedia of DNA, which is so incredibly long, I can give you all kinds of statistics of the billions and... Actually, the DNA for a human being has so many symbols and letters in the code that it would take a hundred volumes of this size, a huge shelf full, just to contain it. But there is a section there that talks about the pelvis. Maybe it's just one volume. And in the volume on the pelvis, the osteoblasts that are going to come to line the pelvis, to make this surface here, they are told, you have got to be four and a quarter inches from your companion over here. Now, this, all this area is full of guts and, and rectums and bladders and all kinds of things. How, <laughs> my goodness, how do you, as a little lonely osteoblast over here, how do you know how far away the osteoblast over here is? Because you've got to stay four and a quarter inches away. The bones mustn't be closer than that. Why? Because a baby's head is four and a quarter inches wide. And if you have these two edges only about three and a half inches or three inches wide, the baby is never going to get born. And if all girls are like that, the human race is finished right now. Because no more babies will be born and all the girls will die in childbirth. Now that's, a, that's an important thing. But think of the amount of design, the amount of words, the amount of code that has to be exactly right to allow these osteoblasts to know how far apart they are and when to stop building bone. And if somehow the hip joint over here says, I'm getting too far away from this hip joint over here. Because if my hip joints are wide apart, it'll hinder my walking. It won't make me such an efficient jumper or runner. Uh, and that's quite true. But you can't have everything. And if you're going to have the enormous privilege of bearing a baby and starting a new life, you've got to be willing to have your hips a little bit further apart to give room for the baby to get out. Now, how do these bone cells know that? How do they know it? They know it by the most incredibly complex codes. And the same code that tells the pelvic 
osteoblasts and osteoclasts, how to organize the shape. You see, there's so many factors coming into this. Look at this. This has got to be designed to be an attachment for the muscles of the abdomen. All my rectus muscles and my muscles that hold my guts together, they're all attached here. And therefore, this is a rough surface and rather kind of wide. And, uh, and then there are others that, that take the urethra and, and that uh, attach to the, to the spine. And uh, there are many, many factors that make for this rather strange shape of a pelvis. But this question of walking is very important. And the same hormone, the same hormone, the estrogen, that, that tries to insist that this pelvis is circular on the inside and smooth, whereas the male pelvis is much narrower, too, ma too narrow for a baby's head, the same hormone also talks to these bones here the lower bones of the, of the spinal column. And this joint here, which is the sacroiliac joint, uh, I mean the sacroiliac joint here and the, and the vertebral joint between the sacrum and the, and the rest of the spine, all those joints know, as soon as these hormones begin to flow, they know whether they're going to be boys or girls. And therefore, the basic cells that make the bone respond. And they make the lower cells, the lower bones of the spine, much more mobile. You get much better joints between this joint, between this bone and this bone and this bone in a girl than you do in a boy. So a girl is able to swing her hips and do a kind of a hula uh, more effectively than a boy can. And so when she walks, she compensates for the distance of her hips being apart by swinging the pelvis. And when she walks, she'll put this foot down. And when this foot goes up, she goes over a little bit. And then she goes over and over. <laughs> now you see, the boy who is walking behind the girl and sees her walking like this, he doesn't say, well, that's poor engineering. Uh, this is a very clever mechanical adaptation to compensate for pure energy. No, no, he just says, boy, that's cute. <laughs> because he likes it. He likes what he sees. And do you know why? It isn't because it's more beautiful. It's because he has a hormone too. And his hormone affects the way he thinks. Of course, girls have hormones in that direction too. But it affects the way he thinks. And he doesn't judge beauty by some abstract standard. He judges it according to what he knows he has to do in relation to girls. And the wonderful thing about the whole DNA and the whole of these coals is that it makes it kind of fun. It makes it, it isn't as if you're being driven and forced to do something for the perpetuation of the race. But the same system, the same design, the same designer that designed the bones and designed the uterus and designed all the other sexual functions knows or knew that they have to work and that it has to happen. Somehow the, the male and the female have to get together in a degree of intimacy which they wouldn't otherwise even think about. And it's done because the way the male thinks about the female and the way the female thinks about the male is organized for them by the same hormone that controls the architecture of the bones and that controls these other things. Isn't, isn't that incredible? Don't you feel <laughs> proud of your hormones? One of the important things about the survival of the human race is that newborn babies not only should be able to breathe within five minutes of being born, not only that their heart should beat, not only all these other things should happen, which they've never happened before, but it needs food. And because the digestion hasn't fully developed, it has to have a very digestible food that conveys every bit of nourishment that it needs, all the vitamins, all the carbohydrates, all the proteins, and even the, even the uh, uh, 
defensive units that we call antibodies that the mother has in her body all have to be made available to the child. And in order to do that, the body has developed, I hate using those words, the body has been designed to have a means of supply of milk carefully orchestrated to the needs of the child as soon as it's born. Now, the simple way to do that would be to have everybody have breasts, which would provide milk from birth to death. But most of the time, most of the people wouldn't be using the milk they make. But they have it because occasionally a woman will have a baby. But what an awful waste of milk, wouldn't it be? <laughs> Let's think of all the milk that would be made when people are not having children. Uh, what would you do with it? Anyway, the, the designer of the body thought it out ahead of time. And there are at least three, there are more than three, there are at least three hormones that control that and prevent waste. And I want you to think about how you would have designed this if you'd, if you'd been responsible for designing a human body. The first is the one we've talked about already, estrogen. The same hormone that determines the shape of the bones is also determining the shape of what happens to the nipple. Now, I've got a couple of nipples. Uh, I've had them for a long time. And I look at them every now and then, I think, nothing's happening. <laughs> uh, and I've had them, and they really haven't changed since I was a little boy. But that's because I've never had enough estrogen to, to, to make them change. But a woman at a certain age in puberty suddenly finds that the nipples are getting bigger and that there's some swelling behind them. Now, that swelling is not milk-producing swelling. We may think of milk is that, that the breast makes milk, but no. Not, not just because a person is woman uh, do they have any milk-producing glands. It simply is a lot of ducts, a nipple, and a lot of fat and structure, collagen. That's all it is. But one time or another, that woman's going to get pregnant. And when she gets pregnant, and that tiny little ovum and sperm join together and become implanted in the wall of the uterus, which has been preparing for it for years, and begins to develop a placenta to draw nourishment from the mother's body, at the same time, as an urgent matter, the body produces another hormone that we call progestin. Here it is, that one. As soon as you're pregnant, this chemical unit, I mean, it's so simple. It looks just like, just like testosterone. But it begins circulating in the body, and it goes to every single cell in the body. But the ones where it makes a difference, it doesn't make a difference to the bones. It makes a difference to the ligaments that hold the bones together. And the ligaments that connect the pelvis together become a little bit loose just in case in nine months' time there isn't room for the baby, it allows the pelvis to, to move a little and to get bigger if necessary. But its primary effect is on the muscle of the uterus. Now, if the muscle of the uterus, of the womb, is stretched, it will automatically contract because those are its orders from the DNA. If you look up the DNA, for the uterus, that's volume number 35. I haven't got it here. Uh, that's what it says. If you're stretched, contract. But progesterone, that little messenger here, the slow messenger, gets to those muscle cells and says, oh, no, you don't. You're pregnant. You can be stretched as much as you like, but you're never to contract. It is an inhibitor of the natural contractility of the uterus. And therefore, for nine months, the woman's body is flooded with progesterone, and her uterus does not contract. And the baby grows and grows and grows until those muscle cells, which started out so small, have become great, big, powerful contractile cells, but they have never contracted. Now, that same progesterone, this guy, 
also is received by the cells of the nipple and the breast and the ducts. And it says, we are pregnant. In nine months' time, we're going to have a baby, and it's got to be fed. Start building glands. Start building milk-producing glands. And now, for the first time, those little ducts and those little passages in the breast and all that fat is changed. It gives place to active ducts. Doesn't make milk. That'd be a waste. It makes active ducts. Bunches and bunches and bunches, like a bunch of grapes, whole bunch of ducts. And the nature and quality of the texture of the breast changes. That's progestin. At the end of nine months, suddenly, the organization of the body, the hypothalamus and everything else in the, in the base of the brain, says, stop producing progestin. It's time. Stop producing progestin. And at the same time, a new hormone, looking just like one of these, but it isn't up here on the board, called prolactin, starts being poured out into the bloodstream. And every part of the body receives prolactin. The ears receive it, and the big toe receives it, the hand receives it, but none of them respond to prolactin. But the cells of the glands, the newly formed glands in the breast, they respond. It's their message. In the body, every cell reads every other cell's mail. <laughs> and they know what belongs to them and what doesn't. And I don't know how they know, but it's programmed into them. And so as the muscle cells of the uterus are allowed at last to contract and become, begin to push the baby through the birth canal that was prepared for them years earlier by the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts, so the, the, the breast becomes full of the first milk it has ever made. And so when a few hours later the baby is born and goes, wah, the mother knows, the mother knows what that means. And it stimulates her to want to feed the child. And the milk is already there. Now how does it stop? Does it then go on forever and ever? Prolactin stops. Prolactin is there to start it going. But, but you don't want it to go on forever. You only want it to last until the baby can take care of itself. And therefore, the control of the flow of milk goes to a different system. And this time, the system is in the baby. The baby's hormones are getting going. And the, and the hormones, the, the signals that tell the baby, I am hungry, the baby doesn't know anything about its stomach, doesn't know what food means. It just has a sensation. I am hungry, and that sensation makes it cry. And then when the baby is sucking and receiving milk, so long as it goes on doing it, milk is going to be formed. The action of the baby controls the milk supply of the mother. And when the baby no longer sucks, the milk stops being produced. And if the mother has triplets or twins, and they're all hungry, she will make twice as much milk, or three times as much milk, as before, because now it's under the control of the babies. It's incredible. Absolutely, absolutely incredible. And I, I just want to leave you, you know, we can't, we could go on all day. Uh, but I want to, to tell you that uh, all of this, all of these amazing slow codes are built into the DNA. They are all in a different code, a code that is made up of four, you know all about those, I'm sure, uh, adenine. There are four molecules, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, two purines and two pyrimidines. And the order in which they occur, not I mean, there's no milk, there's no milk here, there's no bone here, there are no osteoclasts, there are no osteoblasts. There's only a code, only a code. There's no preliminary stage of any chemical that the body needs. It's just a code. But the order in which these letters occur, just like the order in a book here, creates every code that I've talked about and many, many more. Now. 
Before people knew about DNA, before they knew the chemistry of some of these codes, in the last century, people noticed how similar humans were to monkeys and giraffes and so forth. And they said, oh, this must mean that, that we're all one family. We've descended from each other. And the way they thought it could have happened, the changes, would be by chance changes in cells. And if they think that sometimes by the influence of external forces like, like uh, uh, electricity or, or uh, nuclear power uh, or just bad diet, uh, cells would, or DNA, would get changed and there'd be a mutation. And cell mutations would happen by chance. And everybody who, are, who studies evolution has always said that the changes are by chance. And it's by the survival of successful mutations that you get evolution. When the theory of evolution was first announced, back in the days, uh, uh, in, the, in the middle of the last, the end of the last century, people didn't know anything about DNA. They didn't know in detail about the chemistry of these codes. And they simply went by shapes. Uh, they knew that the human had seven vertebrae uh, to make a neck, and that a camel also has seven vertebrae that make a neck. And they thought, well, therefore, we must be related to each other uh, in a kind of family relationship. They discarded the possibility that both had been designed by the same designer that there was an intelligence behind the whole of life. And I think it's good to, for us to think about it ourselves. We've got an intellect. And I like to play Scrabble. And I like to realize that DNA here is constructed of four letters. It is a kind of alphabet. And all of the words and all of the sentences and all of the instructions in DNA, I'm talking now about definite facts that we know about. We can see these things under the microscope. All of it is composed of, in effect, words, chemical words that are nothing to do with the actual process that takes place in the body, but that simply describe it and start it working. And I've tried to play, you know, I've tried to imagine how would I do it, uh, particularly if I had to rely on chance. And I like to play, I used to play Scrabble as a, as a youngster. And here are some Scrabble tiles. And uh, now, what would it take for them to make sense? Well, to begin with, it takes a certain amount of intelligence. I don't have much of that, but have any of you seen a word yet? Here we go, look. B-O-T-H. All right? What does that spell? Both. There you are. You're pretty good. <laughs> Both. Anything else? Here's a word. B-O-N-E-S. Now we have a s almost... There we go. But you see, I had to do that. I had to pick it up. These things didn't lie that way. Uh, now what are they going to do, those two bones? And which bones are they? G, got, here we are, got both bones. Now, I'm seriously trying. <laughs> I'm not fooling. I'm seriously trying to see what words there are. O-U-R, here you are. Our, got both, our bones. Here we are, let's put that in there. Well, then, I. Anyhow, what does it mean? What are you going to do about this? And what bones are you talking about? What I want to ask you is I want you to imagine again and again and again, thousands and thousands and millions of times when all these Scrabble tiles are poured out by chance. How often will you see a word already there? And how long will it take to get, shall we say, three or four words that make a sentence? And then think, 
how often will that sentence be related to an important action that must be accomplished in a body in order, shall we say, for a baby to be born or in order to be able to digest your food or something of that sort? How often will it make sense? How many times would you have to do this to find a sequence of words that all related to one subject and that told you how to do something? Even if you had to wait between each fresh outpouring of chance tiles, how often would you have to, to, to uh, put up with mistakes, with uh, things that weren't actually bad or fatal, but were just something you had to carry around with you. Uh, and do you know there is nothing? When I was a student, I was taught that there were a whole lot of what we called vestigial organs that didn't do anything. I think I may have told you about this before. But today we found that every one of those has a function, and an important one of them is the the thymus gland that makes the whole immune system. I was taught when I was a student that that was just a functionalist remnant from a previous stage of evolution. Every part of you is wonderful. Every part of you works as though it had been designed specifically for that purpose. But you know, don't, don't get too proud of human ingenuity. We still cannot write the code. We still can't write the code. All we can do is to read it. And I'll tell you exactly some of the wonderful things that are being done. Well, one. Let's take one. You know, for years and years and years, people got diabetes. And in diabetes, the insulin uh, isn't made. Insulin is, a, is, is a, an enzyme. And it's, uh, it's stimulated by a hormone. And it grows in the pancreas. The pancreas lies kind of here, under my liver. And... Uh, for some reason, by a genetic breakdown, some people are born with a defect in that area and some people get it by disease. But if you have diabetes, you don't make insulin, the enzyme, the complex. Uh, two, Canadian, two Canadian biologists, Best and Banting, climbed into fame and they spent their whole life studying that one enzyme of insulin. And finally, at the end of their lives, or before the end of their lives, they were able to, to build uh, laboriously the enzyme uh, insulin, but it was infinitely too expensive to put into people. So what we have to do is to, is to make insulin from the pancreas of, of slaughtered animals, and it's all a very expensive and difficult process. And somebody thought, well now, why don't we study the, G the DNA of how insulin is made and let some small animal make it for human beings? make human insulin. And do you know what they do? This is, this is absolutely exciting because it's happening right now. Uh, they look up the human body and they take a volume. Now this is the, the P number to pharynx. Uh, and this is the volume that contains pancreas. And I've marked it ahead of time. Here's the pancreas. And it tells you how the pancreas, now it's only here, it's only a, a few paragraphs, and it says that the pancreas is a digestive enzyme and uh, a digestive organ and that it makes insulin as well. Uh, now, we are not able, as intelligent human beings, to read that and then write it down in another animal to make it work. But what we can do is to take a knife, a special knife, and cut that page out. <laughs> Here we are. Now you see, we've got a couple of pages that describe how insulin is made, all made of adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, the, the four bases that are the letters of DNA. Now we'll find a small animal, not a big animal with a hundred volumes like the human, but something like a rabbit or, a, or even a bacterium. And that has just one volume. Uh, and it, it has no, no brain and no, no very complex things, but it's alive. So let's put these two pages from the human DNA 
into the DNA of an embryo or of a, of a bacterium, like E. coli. And here it is. Now here is an E. coli carrying its own DNA, and when it multiplies and multiplies and multiplies, it will come to that page that I've taken out of somebody's human insulin, and it will make human insulin. It's doing it right now. And if you go to a shop, you can buy, if you're a diabetic, you can buy human insulin made by a bacterium. You can buy, you're beginning to be able to buy human milk made by a goat because they put pages from the human DNA into a goat, so instead of making goat's milk, it makes human milk. Very clever. But how pathetically inferior in the level of intelligence to the real thing where the whole of DNA, all of the volumes of DNA, of everything I've talked about, and a thousand times more, is all written out in great detail. And it works, and it's reproduced generation after generation for thousands of generations. Isn't it incredible? <laughs> I mean, doesn't it, doesn't it boggle your mind? And don't you feel sorry for some of the people who are still being asked to teach you that everything happened by chance, simply because scientists haven't had time to think up a new theory to work it out. And I want to tell you, again as I started, that you are wonderful and that, that uh, somehow uh, there are volumes of wisdom uh, in you. Uh, for example, in the making of your brain, you are the only type of living creature on Earth that can think about these sort of things. I could talk all day to a giraffe, <laughs> and, uh, and it wouldn't be any wiser at the end. But this can come into us, and we are capable of reflecting on it of thinking what significance it has in our own lives. We can ponder about it. We can talk to each other about it. How we came to be, where we want to go, what we want to do. Uh, our hormonal codes are wonderful. And some of you are experiencing the effects of them right now. Uh, but our creative mind, which is the highest part of the human design, our creative mind can override these hormones. It can say to itself, I'm not going to be just pushed around by, by a DNA. I have a higher quality in me that can think about who I am and can think about what I want to do, and I can invoke a sense of the effect of what I want to do on other people who may be helped or who may be harmed. We can develop the moral sense, which is at the basis of all civilization, concern for other people, the ability to to try to understand them and to, to help them. We can seek. Nobody can stop us from seeking to know more about the designer of our human bodies, uh, the one who ultimately created us for a purpose. And I think it's, it's important, the more we realize how wonderful we are, to realize that it's a mandate for behaving in a healthy way, for not fooling around with things that can, that can produce false, uh, as it were, hormones. A, a, lot of the, a lot of the drugs and other things that we are advised and pushed to take these days are really imitation hormones. They force you into methods of behavior, uh, which maybe you realize with your intellect are not appropriate. So uh, explore the mysteries of yourself. Be thankful for yourself. Treat yourself well and realize that it affects other people too. God bless you all.